All right, so as we dive into the second section of the chapter, it's basically taking a look at everything you know. All these transactions, how the debits and credits work with each other, and then how do we actually start doing what real accountants would do in journalizing and what's called posting everything that happens, okay? I did a quick snapshot of the big vocab for this section. You don't have to take notes on any of it, but certainly um, in your own notes, maybe highlight those key vocab terms. Um, if we start running out of time, I'll leave chart of accounts to first thing tomorrow. But those are some of the big key vocab terms for this section. With the first being, what is a journal? <clears throat> a journal is a book. Uh, there's lots of different kinds of journals. We will be starting our work with what's called the, the general journal. It's where transactions are originally entered and then pushed to other places eventually. Think of it like the accountant's notebook, really. Now, most accountants in the industry today are going to have a digital journal somewhere on a computer. You, of course, are going to do your journal by hand. But what you need to know about a journal is it's in chronological order by date. So the first things that happen in the month will be recorded and then on to you know, October 3rd, October 4th, all the way through the end of October. And it is many, many, many pages long with a lot of transactions. So it's the place where transactions are recorded in order by date. Now, when I say a transaction, you actually know what those are. You've been working with them for Chapter 1 and into even Chapter 2. So when the owner invests cash, cash go up, cash goes up, excuse me, capital goes up. If we pay our utility bill, cash goes down, expenses go up. Okay, those are transactions, and we're just going to put them in a fancy place called the general journal. This is what one looks like. This should be in your supplemental handout. And there's five steps to journalizing. The first thing we do is we list the date. So although you're writing it up here, I'd maybe mark it in here as well. So that's number one. You're always going to date your journal entry. Remember, they go in chronological order. Then you're going to always, 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 always list the debit first. So not only list the amount, but the account title. So what we're debiting, the title and the amount. So in this case, here's number two. We're debiting cash for $10,000. What do you think happens next? If you have a debit, you always have a credit. So then you're going to list the credit and its amount. The cool part is there's a debit column and a credit column. Debits on the left, credits on the right, just like the wrap things. So we list the debits and we list the credits. What do you notice about the credit line? Is it indented? Often it's indented. It doesn't have to be, but visually, if you had a long month's worth of transactions here, you can easily tell debits and credits by the use of indenting. Then you need to have a brief explanation of the transaction. So basically, restate the transaction on the next line. The transaction would have originally read the owner, Jim Johnson, 
uh, invested $10,000 into the business. You'd list the debit, you'd list the credit, and then on that fourth line, or not excuse me, the fourth line, the fourth step, you'd basically say owner invest cash in business. I'm not going to be so nitpicky on how you word those descriptions. And in fact, I didn't learn accounting this way, so I'll oftentimes mentally forget them. So if you're like, Mrs. Mars, what about that explanation? Please remind me as often as you can. But this book likes to see that fourth step of a brief explanation. And then the fifth thing is you have to reference, you have to look in the reference column. You're going to find out what 101 and 301 mean in a minute. And you're also going to find out where those are posted. So five steps. Date, list your debit, list your credit, explain what's going on in the transaction, and then reference reference the transaction. Now when you think of these entries, what you saw here was a simple, yes, sorry, Sydney. That's step four. Yep, I should have put a number four there and a five there. See, I'm already forgetting about it. It's basically restating the transaction in a more chopped up way. Thank you for mentioning that. So this, this transaction would be considered a simple entry. There's two accounts, there's one debit, and there's one credit. So two accounts, one's being debited, one's being credited. You've done compound entries before, you just didn't know it. It's when three or more accounts are involved. So example would be one or more debit and one or more credit. This is the perfect example of a compound entry. We bought equipment with some cash down, and then we owe the remainder. You, you've done those before. Okay, so if we purchased equipment, equipment would be the debit. But how would we pay for it? Cash would be credited, but then so would AP. So let's say we bought $1,000 worth of equipment. That would be our debit. If we paid $200 in cash, what would be our other credit? What would be our other credit? Because remember, debits need to equal credits. Does 1,000 equal 200? No, but 1,000 does equal 200 plus 800. Okay, so that's the difference between a simple and a compound entry. Compound entry is just when there's one or more debit or one or more credits. But remember, they always need to equal. You'll notice I did that in a journal fashion there. That, that's what we're going to get used to doing. I indented my credits. And I listed my debit first. Once we've journalized in this long chronological format, think of it as like the accountant's journal or diary, like Dear Diary, here's what happened on October 1st. Dear Diary, here's what happened on October 2nd and 3rd and 4th and 5th. Then we need to post what to what I call the mini camps. You basically transfer all of your journal activity to a ledger. So the journals, the long chronological stuff, the ledgers have little, it tells the story of each account, what's going on in cash, what's going on in equipment, what's going on in AP, okay? Here is a visual representation of what the ledgers look like. <clears throat> a general ledger contains the entire group of accounts, but then they're itemized out. So in the ledger, there's all the asset accounts. You know, this one, this one, this one, and this one. They all tell the individual stories. What's going on in equipment? What's going on in cash? So it's a more targeted snapshot of each individual account. Okay? And then we look at the liabilities. We have all these different payables. Under owner's equity, we have capital and revenue. Those follow the rules. 
expenses and drawings do not, but they're still under that umbrella. So you got to think of each of these as the umbrellas. And underneath there tells the story of each individual account. Because if you think back a minute, this journal, it's this long list of everything that happened in the month. I see cash. I see owner's capital. I might see this. I might see that. I might see cash again. Well, when we post or transfer it over from the journal to the ledgers, then I get an exact look at just cash. When did we get it? When did we send it? When did we get more? When did we send more? This should be in your notes as well. Here would be an example of a, you know, is this a journal or a ledger? It says at the top. It's a journal. I see cash. I see owner's capital. I see equipment, note table. I see cash again. Come down here. I see cash again, but this time we're... So, like, to look at that and know exactly where we stand with cash or supplies or what do we owe in AP, it's, it's a mess to try to sift through it, but that's why we take each account and tell their story individually. So again, here's the journal. Remember that's chronological. Seemingly looking a little messy, but if I want to know exactly where I stand with cash, well then in the ledger, here's each of the little individual stories or mini camps. Can you tell that it's organized by Allo? Okay, I see cash, supplies, prepaid insurance, equipment. Those are all the assets. Assets are always listed first in the ledger, followed by payable, payable. Those are the liabilities. You're seeing, um, this is for a corporation because I see common stock, dividends. Okay, but then all of these are, of course, OE. So although this looks really unorganized or a lot of information, it's actually very organized because here it's like, here's what happened, October 1st through the 31st. But then every time we put a debit or credit in, then we also transfer it over and see here's October 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 20, 26, 31. Here's just the activity for cash. It's all transferred from here. And this is a little bit more of a snapshot on the individual accounts. Here's where things get very tedious. This is very, very tedious to do, and it takes a lot of workbook pages. We'll find that out tomorrow, okay? Because every transaction, like here, cash over to here, I have to stop, go find cash, and do that line. Then I go and find the other half of it. Here's owner's capital, a credit. And I go find owner's capital, it's not even on here. This must be a snapshot, but we'd, we'd, we'd put it in. Then I'd come back here and go to equipment, journalize that, come and post it. Now here's where things are a lot easier in the industry. They actually hit a button and it, boop, it posts right away for them and updates all of the balances. You have to do it all by hand. And do you see where if you screw one thing up, one little thing, the whole thing would be off. I'm going to give you a quick analogy with just how we operate as a school. Okay? Is there a section for this in your notes that I gave you? I think maybe. Uh, maybe not. No, I don't think so. Okay, if you if you think about our school. When I say Morris Area High School, you, you think everybody. Well, there's a senior hallway, there's a junior hallway, there's the 10th grade, the 9th grade, the 8th grade, and the 7th grade hallways. Right? That's just like the journal ledger relationship. I can say 10th graders, but in MAHS, they're kind of in the grand scheme of things. Maybe I'd list all of our students alphabetically, kind of like chronologically, if you will, okay? 
well, how am I going to know anything that's impacted by the 10th graders? Well, I'd have to go to the 10th grade hallway to find the 10th grader. Okay, this is very similar to the journal ledger relationship because then there's you know there's cash, there's that um, equipment, supplies. I could go to AP. I could go to NP. So you get the idea. Like this tells the big story. Here's everyone at MAHS. Here's everything that happened chronologically. But then I have to shuffle information to individual mini camps or mini accounts to tell the specific stories. Does that make sense? So this is the journal, the chronological kind of messy, if you will. And here are the ledgers, the one ledger that tells each of the stories. What questions do you have before I keep going to really show you the process here? This is part of the general ledger. This is what one account looks like specific. Okay. Where did I get all of this information? Where did this come from? This is the story for just cash. It looks like June 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 9, 17, 20, 30. I see some debits, and this case would be a plus. I see some credits, which would be a minus, and the balance is updated every time. Okay, where did I get all this information from? Give me the vocab term. This is like the senior hallway, if you will. Yes, it came from the general journal. Is the general journal as easy to tell the cash story as this? No, it's that big long list. There's cash some places, but it's scattered in with all the other stuff. Just like when I watched you guys at the pep fest on Friday, you were all scattered all over the place. Some of you were on the floor. Some of you were in the band. Some of you were not there. <laughs> okay. Some of you were sitting by your buddies. Some of you were, you know, you're all over the place. Okay, right now, MAHS is all over the place. I see some seniors in here. I see some juniors in here. But if I say snapshot, I want to see just the juniors. That's saying I want to see just the cash, where it goes up, where it goes down. Okay, do you see why you need your journal to even make this, though? You know, this looks really confusing, but don't be alarmed. It's not. It just shows... It, it basically answers this question of where, okay? If you take a look, here's the general journal. Remember, it's the messy chronological thing. And every time I debit or any time I credit, I have to go tell and update the, the mini camps or the ledger. So here's the journal, the big one. Here's the ledger. Of course, the ledger would have every account listed, but right now I'm only concerned with number 101 and 301. So we debited cash for $15,000. So I have to go tell that story in the cash ledger. I'm not done, though, because I have to bring this number 101 back and put it in my reference number. You're going to find out what 101 means in a minute. So I journalized and posted my debit. Now I need to journalize and post my credit. So I credited owner's capital for the same amount. Is this a simple or compound entry? Simple. What would make it compound? Three or more. So one or more debit, one or more credit. Okay. So I... I credited that 15000 but I have to go tell that to the owner's capital story. So then I come, I find owner's capital, it's page, 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 I dig, 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 okay, and I throw the 15000 in, update the balance, but then I have to go back and tell that 301 story. Now, did you see a new reference number around here? J 
What do you think J stands for? Journal, page, one. Big companies are going to have many, many J1s. Or many, many J1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. I bet my recording thing is covering up where it says J1. Is that true? Yes. And they gave you a really nice little, here are the steps. Number one, number two, number three, number four. When we do this tomorrow, it's going to make a lot more sense. But it's going to be a lot of page flipping. Do you see where this is going to take you a while? It's kind of putsy. I'd say there's one of three approaches here. I'll have some students do, and I'm going to backtrack a minute. I'll have some students do all of this first. They'll do all of their journalizing first, and then they'll pull second. I'll have some students do just a whole transaction here, and then they'll go post second. Or I'll have some students do, okay, here's my debit, I'll go post that. Here's my credit, I'll go post that. Do you see how the last option is kind of putsy? I would say most people do the second option where they do the transaction, go post the debit and credit. Do the next transaction, go post the next debit and credit. Some students are like, oh my gosh, that drives me nuts, too much page flipping. So then they'll do this whole thing first and then go do all the posting second. I should tell you these lines right here. This represents posting. Okay, I don't want you to get confused with, you know, there's general journal, general ledger. But the process of moving it, I shouldn't say moving, transferring, the, the process of these red lines to tell the individual story is called posting. It's the process of transferring numbers from one place to another. That's that posting process. See if you can get this question right. Why is it D? Why was it not B? I see the word transfer there, transaction data. That would have made D B correct. Remember, posting is a process to transfer stuff from the journal to the ledger. Let's take a quick review, okay? There, this is in your notes. This is in your supplemental handouts as well. This is what we did all of last week. So this should be piece of cake. What's another word for debit? Of course, credit one then means right. Is there a left and right of the big LOT? Are there left and rights in individual T's? Does debit always mean increase? No, depends on which side of the big T you're on, or if you're one of the naughty accounts that doesn't follow that rule. Okay, so debit balance accounts, so that's where the normal balance side resides. It's also where the increase happens. And I usually star the normal balance side, so the star and plus have a lovely working relationship with each other, okay? Credit balance accounts, of, again, still a star, still a plus. So anything opposite of that debit and credit in those cases would be, of course, a minus. So debit balance accounts are all assets. We're going to learn the order they're listed in, in in a minute, but that of course includes cash, AR, supplies, and equipment. Those are the four big ones that you've learned about. As we progress through the chapters, you're going to learn more that uh, prepaid insurance is an asset. 
I guess I'm a little surprised they don't introduce that yet, but it'll come. Okay. Let's stop there. Are there some more that have debit balances? Two big ones, but we're going to pause for a minute and come over here. Um, we're moving to the right side of the big T, so all liabilities. So anything with the word payable in it. So we have AP and NP, accounts payable and notes payable. There's many, many others, but those are the two big ones. <clears throat> now, I'm not going to say all owner's equity accounts. I am going to say that capital is one, and what's the other one that has a credit balance on the right? Revenue. Because those, as part of the normal expanded accounting equation, make rev revenue and capital make OE go up. Are there two that make OE go down, though? We can't list them on the credit side because they don't follow credit rules. So there are a few OEs over here. Any expenses and, of course, drawing. Now, I keep calling them naughty accounts because they technically belong under owner's equity. It's just that they don't follow owner's equity rules because, really, they make owner's equity decrease in value. So we can't put an expense as a credit because that would make owner's equity go up. We have to list it as a debit to offset that. So that's how you would have answered that question that was posed on your reading quiz last Friday or something similar. OK, you also see this. This is a quick review. This is much like the MAHS 12th grade, 11th grade, 10th grade hallway example that I just gave you. When I call you MAHS and throw you in a pep fest scenario, you're all over the place just like a journal. Remember, journals are chronological by date. You might see cash sprinkled throughout, but then the process to get it over to the general ledger tells each individual account story. What's that process called? Posting from the journal to the individual ledgers. Why do accountants even have to have general ledgers? What if the boss walks in and knock, 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 tell me how cash is doing today? Well, if they haven't posted and told the individual cash story, do you really have any idea? I mean, they'd have to sit and suck cash out of here. Well, I guess, boss, this is kind of a rough estimate. Well, no. Boss isn't going to be cool with a rough estimate when it comes to cash, and, or any of these for that matter. And so they want to know the individual story. What are the five steps to the journalizing process? Don't look at your notes. Let's write them in. Back on the chronological day by day by day thing, what's the first thing we do? Date. The second thing we do that's always first in relation to the other one, okay, the debit, and we're looking for what Ira just said, the account title and amount. Remember, debits are always listed first. If there's a debit, what else has to go with it? A credit, and also that account title an amount. Number four, the one Mrs. Mars is going to forget all the time because I didn't learn this way. The brief explanation, basically just retelling the story, re rewriting the um, transaction. And number five is the reference. Where are we getting the reference? That's after we post. Cash, let's just say this said cash. It's typically account number 101, or depending on how large your business is, maybe it's even 100, but 101. Then we're going to come back here and say, OK, cash, yes, we did. There, there you were debited. We'd put 101 in. OK? We're 
We're going to take some time to just look at some transactions, think about what's going on, journalize, and how, you would, how it would look if you're posting, okay? I gave you these page by page. Now this is like a big analysis. Like you're never going to do this. Like we're going to basically do when we when we do transactions and I'm teaching you about them and you're doing them. This is what I will walk you through. Just verbally. I'll say, okay, you guys, let's, let's think about what this transaction says. And I'll sometimes mark it up and do different things. So this, you're never going to really, like, write out these two steps. You're just going to think about it and I'll walk you through them, okay? But I do like how detailed it is. So on October 2nd, Pioneer receives $1,200 cash advance from Arnox, a client for advertising services. So we must be the advertising agency and someone prepaid us, okay? So if, if I'd read this blue section, an, an asset cash increase, the liability of unearned revenue increases because the service has not been provided yet. This is getting kind of advanced. This is later in the book, but whatever. Okay. So then I'd say, all right, we got cash. We have to do the work. It hasn't happened yet. So that's why it's a liability. Again, this is really pretty advanced for us right now, but that's okay. So I have a debit and a credit. We'd, we'd then journalize, you know, here's the date, here's the debit, here's the credit. Let's do a brief explanation of it. Now let's post that. Go find cash in the big long list of ledgers. Go find unearned service liability in the big list of ledgers. Let's update them. But then for the fifth step, don't forget these two have to come over and be referenced. Okay, let's keep walking through some of them. Next page. <clears throat> On October 3rd, Pioneer pays office rent for October in cash. So we paid we paid our rent. Okay. Well, I see a 900. I see the word rent and I see cash. That's usually what I will do in transactions with you. Okay, I'll say let's let's circle. That's basically what the basic analysis just was. Then I'll ask you, did cash go up or down? Well, if we pay cash, it goes down. But our rent expense also offsets owner's equity. So now I'd say let's go ahead and do the transaction. So what's our date? October 3rd. Okay, what was our debit? Well, I don't know, Mars. I, I know we, we, we paid cash. Well, if you paid cash, that has to be a credit. So the other half has to be a debit. So I'd walk you through that. Then we'd post and bring these numbers back for step five. The reason I gave you these hard copy is because they are in your book. And I think they're going to be helpful when you're doing this out of class. This is a lot of detail here. And it's gonna, it's gonna work better for you when we put it into practice tomorrow. Okay, the reason I brought up prepaid insurance is I knew this was coming. On October 4th, Pioneer pays uh, $600 of a one-year insurance policy. Um, so cash went down, but insurance went up. We own insurance. It's part of the asset umbrella. So then I'd say, okay, well, if cash went down, the other half has to be a debit. Well, if we gained insurance, we gained more stuff that we owned, that would be our debit followed by the credit. Now go post that and then bring your references back up. It will never go this fast because we're flipping pages to get everywhere. And you'll get those journal pages tomorrow and ledger pages. I just wanted you to have as many of these um, from the book. We bought an estimated three months worth of supplies on account. Well, I'll ask the question, did cash go down? No, AP went up. We now owe people more money. So we have a debit of supplies because that went up, but we also owe more. 
and you would be writing in these debits, writing in these credits, the one, the two, the three, the four, and that you, you wouldn't put those fifth step, fifth step in yet because we have to post and then bring the balances back up. I like this one. It's kind of tricky. On October 9th, Pioneer hires four employees to begin work on October 15th. They list their salaries, but the question is, are we journalizing anything? We hired them. We're not paying them until October 15th. We aren't journalizing anything there. Well, what if it was October 15th? That'd be different because then we're paying them. Yes. Ooh, I, didn't, I quit reading. They're going to begin work. Thank, thank you, Ira. We're not even paying them for another couple weeks. What about CR Bird withdraws $500 cash for personal use? So then I'd stop and ask you, what happened to cash? Did it go up or go down? It went down. So it can't be a debit. It has to be a credit. Well, the other half has to be a debit, and that makes sense because owner's drawing makes owner's equity go down. So then we'd journalize it, we'd post it, and bring our reference numbers back up. My goodness, how many are these? Are they? You can just have those as a reference, the rest of them. I just wanted you to have hard copies of them. I did want to spend some time talking about chart of accounts. You've seen a little taste of it. If you haven't figured this out, every account, so everything under the asset umbrella, under everything under liabilities, owner's equity, and you're now introduced to revenue and expenses actually have their own umbrellas. Every account has a number. I really don't like how they numbered these, but no one asked me. <laughs> I'm going to give you a couple more examples, but the assets are typically in the 100 or 1,000s. I'm just going to go with 100 because that's pretty common. Big, big, huge businesses, I'll list them as like in the 1,000s. Liabilities are typically the 200s. I'd write these in. Owner's equities are the 300s, okay? So the one, two, and 300s are the balance sheet accounts. Revenue is 400 and expenses are 500, and those are the income statement accounts. Notice what they did there. They took out revenue and took out expenses and made them their own umbrellas. That's how you're going to typically see it from here on out. What do you see new under owner's equity? Income summary, that exists for one day only out of the whole fiscal period, and it's used to close out, now we're getting really technical here, we're, it's used for one day only to close out our temporary accounts that will roll into our permanent accounts. Okay, that's a whole other unit, a whole other lesson. Ira? Um, I would say the one, two, three, four, five hundreds are pretty standard for most businesses. Once you understand these, you could look at really big chart of accounts and understand and work through them. Okay. Um, I would say the variable is how they number them. Like, I would say cash is usually 101, but I don't know why they went to 112 for AR. That's the kind of weird part. Okay, the other part I want to talk about here is the order that they're listed. Assets are always in order by liquidity. A very liquid asset is cash. The remainder are not necessarily cash, but how quick could you get them to cash? Could you go beat down the door of all the ARs that owe you money and get your money? Supplies, if you really needed to sell your paper and pencils and paper clips, you could get cash for those. 
Businesses usually don't do that until they have what are called liquidation sales because they're trying to liquidate all their stuff and all the stuff they own into cash. Okay, it's kind of hard to re get er, excuse me recover your prepaid insurance. Usually, when you prepay for something, they don't like to give you your money back. Okay, and then on down. So the order of liquidity, how fast it can equal cash. Okay, liabilities are typically, I don't know, they're, you might say notes payable. Why is an account payable 200? And, you know, now why are we skipping from before we had started with 101, why is it going to 200? I don't necessarily like how this is numbered, okay? Um, I would say it's usually based off the amount owed. That can vary, though. Yes. It would, and you, and that's why this is kind of a bad example. Usually prepaid insurance is the least liquid asset. Is that what you were going to ask? I mean, couldn't you go sell the combine and get cash for it versus, yeah. So I don't love this one. That's why I've given you two more examples that are coming up. But usually prepaid insurance is at the bottom of the list. It's the least liquid asset, I would say. Okay. Um, Expenses, I've seen it two ways. I've seen it alpha listed, so like alphabetized. Like usually advertising expenses at the top, you'll oftentimes see utilities expense at the bottom because it's listed in alpha order. Um, but it sometimes, and again, this varies by company, sometimes it's um, by the amounts or balances. Like the most, like the highest balances at top the smallest balance is at the bottom. So I've seen it both ways, okay? I want to give you a better example, though, because this one isn't the best. This is what the book provides, but I agree, and I'm glad that you guys are asking things like, why isn't prepaid insurance at the bottom? Because it's really hard to recover that cash. Um, here, here's a, here's a, I would say, a better listing. I just pulled this from the internet. Um, You'll notice the assets, oh, liabilities, owners, equity, revenue, expenses. So there's the one, two, three, four, five hundred. You don't even see prepaid insurance on that list, but would you agree that's a pretty good liquidity order? I, I think so. What I don't like about that list is how tight the numbers are. Okay. I want to pop ahead to the next one. And I want to give you a better listing. Okay. It's going back to the pioneer advertising, but I want to give you what I would call a better listing. When you go by tens, you've got wiggle room. It gives you wiggle room. Okay, let's go over here a minute. Remember, expenses are the 500. Now, let's just imagine this is like a yeah, perfect list. Oh, is that the end? Okay. We'll pick up right where we left off tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. If you're confused, especially with those big charts where I talked about them and kind of skipped a couple, don't worry, because we're going to put it all into practice Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. We're going to actually do the work, and you'll start to see how tedious it is, but you're also going to see that it's pretty easy.